Good evening, everybody. <laughs> Cheers. We've arrived at this point, the final session of the evening. But before I hand over to Carol, um, I'd just like to have a, a big shout out to the committee and the so many past members of the committee here. And um, we've got Pam and Gina and Anton and right back to um, our, from the very first session, um, we have Brendan, I can't see him, but um, I am and will be forever indebted for helping me break a few rules at, AS, um, at AUT. And of course, our wonderful Peter Wells, our founder, who left a bequest to enable this festival to continue. And I think he'd be delighted at the numbers that we've had over this weekend. I've also mentioned the Auckland Girls Connection already today. Um, We've got Charmaine, the principal of our time, and Jen, who presented earlier on, and now we have Carol. Carol and I never work simultaneously. She drove her white mini out, I drove my white mini in. <laughs> but we have connected in so many ways and uh, um, subsequently, um, even though I was so incredibly in awe of her. And um, we've done playback theater together, and she was once my landlady. So Carol, take it away. Well, I'm going to start here and then I'm going to just, um, and I'll, I'll introduce each of the speakers from here and then I will just stay in my chair over there and thank them and, and invite the, the next person up so that I'm not popping up and down all the time. But um, I was invited also to bring an object from home because this is the whole point of this session. And so I immediately was drawn to this plate that I have sitting on my bench at home. I don't know if you can see the detail on it. Um, some of you who know me well will know that I have an adult son who has a mild intellectual disability. He is wonderfully talented at music and also at art. And I went to the Titarangi um, Gallery there to look at some art that he had in an exhibition of um, disabled artists. And I noticed these wonderful plates on the wall, and in particular I was drawn to this one. And I kept going back to it, and I kept going back to it. And I realized, of course, if you look closely, that the lines, the black lines, form the, um, the profiles of not one woman, but two. And there are little bobbles all over here. And I suddenly realized that the red ones were nipples. <laughs> I subsequently discovered that this wonderful plate was made by Jared's art teacher. She is an extraordinary woman called Anna Crichton, and on the back of the plate is written, Back Together Again. So that meant a lot to me. The next time I saw Anna, I said, I have bought your plate from the exhibition. Tell me about being back together again. And it so turns out, um, as the sort of final bit to that story, is that one of Jared's most beautiful paintings, um, a painting of a container ship, a huge big oil on canvas, um, her partner Debbie actually bought it and it is sitting on the wall of their house and I cannot think of a better place for it to be. So that is Anna Crichton's wonderful plate, Back Together Again, with the two women, and they live in my house. <laughs> so we're going to start tonight with Chris Bickle, because he is the editor, with Judith Collard, of this wonderful book, Queer Objects. And the whole point of the session tonight is objects from home, queer objects from home. And this is the book that has inspired the session. Now, Chris is Professor of Gender Studies at Otago University. And I thought, isn't that fantastic? We've actually got a Professor of Gender Studies. So we've come a long way. Um, Chris has published widely on the history and sociology of sexuality and identity, with particular emphasis on New Zealand's gay history. And many of you will remember the wonderful Mates and Lovers, which is long out of print now, but um, was the it has always been the definitive history of male homosexuality in New Zealand. 
He's currently editing James Courage Diaries for publication in 2021, and James Courage, I had never heard of him, Chris, um, was one of New Zealand's most overlooked gay writers. So um, it's, it's important to remember these people. Um, I think that Chris might tell us a bit more about that. There's an international focus on this and exploring the, the historical, political, and social significance of LGBT material culture. So Chris is coming up first, but I'm going to go through and introduce each of them in turn. I might just pop this here so you can see it. There we go. Second will be Jack Ramiel Cotterall. Jack sitting here next to Chris. And Jack is Ngāti Rangi, and he describes himself as a cryptid. And I thought, what on earth is a cryptid? I do not know what a cryptid is. So I asked people, and I looked it up. And what I've come up with, it means that we not, may not be able to prove scientifically that Jack actually exists. <laughs> It's possible he's a mythical creature. <laughs> Certainly that he eludes precise and perfect description. And I decided maybe we're all cryptids. <laughs> Jack says that he lurks in the hills of East Auckland, surfacing only for rugby and cricket. The thing he specialises in, though, is writing flash fiction, and he's brilliant at it. He was nominated for the 220 Sir Julius Vogel Award and also last year received the Sir James Wallace Prize for his collection of flash and micro fiction. But he has promised to one day write something longer than 1,000 words. And I'm thinking that if we're lucky tonight, he might speak more than 1,000 words. <laughs> Then we will have Ian Watt, who I remember well um, when he was the uh, managing editor of Reed Publishing. Uh, uh, gone long ago now, Reed Publishing. It was a wonderful publishing house. So Ian is a retired um, editor and publisher. He worked for many years in the UK and then came back to New Zealand to work for Reed and to publish groundbreaking, we're talking about the 1990s, groundbreaking fiction by Robert Leake, Peter Wells, and Witi Ihimaira. So Ian is, is responsible for those first novels coming out from those wonderful writers. Um, Ian's been on the board of Same Same But Different since its inception, and he organises the annual Peter Wells Short Fiction Contest, the results of which he's going to announce tonight. So at the end of this session, we'll hand over to Ian to announce those results. And interestingly, um, Having edited other people's work for so many years, he's now doing some writing of his own. So it'll be interesting to see what you produce, yes. And last but not least, Raymond Tuaka, um, Te Rawa, has more than 17, at least 17 years of experience in the New Zealand film and television industry as a documentary maker, actor, singer, songwriter, and TV presenter. She's one of the first trans women to produce, direct, and present content in Aotearoa, including Takatapui, which some of you will remember. She was one of the, the three people fronting Māori television's first ever LGBTQI plus show. She covered the death of Carmen Rupe in 211. She was one of the actors portraying Georgina Byer in a full-length film, and there's been a documentary about her herself, the making of Ramon, shown on Triangle Television. She's also directed a 25-minute video, Pacific Voices, for the New Zealand AIDS Foundation. Most recently, in 2018 and 19, was a WebFest New Zealand-nominated director and producer for Attitudes, Glimpse, and Crips in Cars. But the most important thing is a film you need to go and see right now. She is portraying Ellie, the trans act activist, in New Zealand's first trans drama, Rurangi. And Rurangi is showing right now. We, we checked, we looked it up to make sure I wasn't going to send you somewhere on a wild goose chase. It is actually on right now as we speak at the Rialto, the Bridgeway, the Academy, possibly others. So that is something you need to go. And I get, Ian, you've seen it, haven't you? It's fantastic. It's fantastic. I mean, I've heard other people say tonight, this is a brilliant film. Someone back here is saying, really good. Yeah. So you must go to see it, okay? <laughs> Thank you.
And, and fr from a bookseller's point of view, um, I'm interested that her, her latest creative project is a graphic novel. Aho Wahine, is this right? Oh. You're doing a graphic novel in which she interprets four Maori stories. So I'm, I'm actually astonished, Ramon, that you've got time to be here tonight at all. I'm not here. <laughs> You're not here. <laughs> She's a mythical creature. <laughs> so I would invite Chris to come up first of all. Please welcome Chris Brickle. Kia ora koto. I'm so happy I made it across the stage without tripping over any of the equipment. So I think that's the first thing we could all hope for up here. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Carol, for your introduction. I feel like I'm actually slightly surrounded by versions of the same thing because the object I want to talk to you about tonight is actually... It is from home, it's in my home. I'm going to tell you a little, bit, a little about the history of it. It's actually the thing that is on the background of the cover to queer objects, which, when you look at it, you can see the Q and the O. My wonderful designer friend, Katie Yakmus, designed the cover. What you may not have seen, or you might, I'm not sure how good the lighting is uh, from down there, is these little patterns behind it. And you may have wondered why that is there. I could also talk about the thing on the back jacket, uh, if I've got a bit of time but I don't want to hog time and probably not more than a thousand words. So, the little globules, which I suggested suggestively to Katie could be interpreted as... Um, no, no. <laughs> It's a one directional only. Oh, look. How's that? There it goes. That looks good. Um, yeah, okay. So it, I actually quite like the globules. <laughs> um, too. Okay, yay. Does that sound better? Yeah. <laughs> I thought I was going to need a box to stand on. I'm not used to these kind of microphones. I usually have the lapel ones, which means I can kind of flip my way across the stage backwards and forwards and still be heard. Oh, that's even better. <laughs> yes. All right. So in a lecture theatre, I would call this my Madonna microphone because it's kind of vaguely glamorous. Now, I've totally lost track of myself, but that's what usually happens with me. Globules, globules. Anyway, so sorry. So I thought the globules could be interpreted kind of as semen, and Katie had an interpretation that was rather different, but unfortunately I've forgotten what it was. So I can only give you one of the possible interpretations. But actually, audience participation number one could be how might we interpret these globules. But where do the globules come from? Well, actually, the cover for the book is a part of this, which is a Japanese incense box, which was, um, I was going to say, discovered by its owner during World War II, but I've only just noticed for the first time ever it says 75 cents on the back. So it may in fact not have uh, come from uh, the Pacific, which is where the owner uh, was based. So. Um, Yes, I've just discovered something about my own object while standing at the podium. <laughs> it goes to show you should also always turn things around to look at both sides. There's a par uh, sort of a, yes, a parable in there somewhere. So, the object started life as a makeup box. Now, this was in the collection of John Hunter. John Hunter was one of the uh, female impersonators in the Kiwi Concert Party. Those of you who were here earlier on today would have heard Brent Coots talking about the Kiwi Concert Party and three of the men he interviewed, two of the men he interviewed who used to be part of that concert party. Um, John Hunter was reasonably young. He was only in his 20s during the war and he didn't actually go overseas. He served um, during uh, the war in um, Auckland. He was part of the Ambulance Corps in Auckland. Uh, but later, when the Kiwis toured uh, Melbourne, uh, Sydney, uh, Brisbane, I think, and around New Zealand. He was an integral part of that, um, that, uh, that scene. So he bought the box, but in actual fact, it wasn't used to store, um, it wasn't used to store incense, which was its original purpose. Uh, if anyone um, 
can uh, read Japanese writing, can you please let me know afterwards? Because I'd be really interested to know what this says. I'm actually not quite sure what the Japanese lettering, um, what the Japanese lettering uh, says. Inside the box, and I'm going to show you, I've blown up the contents, not in a dynamite sense, but on a photocopier, and I can show you in a bit more detail, but actually it's used as a stage makeup box, which is why even though it's actually an incense box, I refer to it as a makeup box. And so these are pastels in a number of different colours made by a stage makeup making company whose name I have now temporarily forgotten. Lichner, Leichner, it's a German company. Um, there's a catalogue of these. There are a whole lot of different colours. Each colour has a number. What you can't tell from here is that they actually have quite an intense smell. So if you can imagine your senses being assailed slightly by the contents of this box, they're kind of waxy and oily, if you can imagine a kind of a coloured, waxy, oily kind of thing going on. And these were used to uh, provide very strong kind of colour uh, on the face of someone in, um, in uh, the stage professions, like John was. That's a little kind of uh, stick, a piece of pastel. There's a thinner one here. You probably can't see these, but wait, I've got my special device, which I'll show you in a moment. And there are actually toothpicks in here for you to pick little bits of makeup out of the end and pop them on your face. So I rather like this. My first thought upon opening up it was, what would it be like to wear it? And so one of the things for questions is, has anyone worn this kind of incredibly waxy stage makeup? Leichner developed this in the 1870s, so in fact you could see uh, the makeup over the strength of the limelight, which was uh, those lights along the front of a stage, which were originally um, a kind of a, um, a fairly weak kind of light, and so you need a very strong makeup in order to be seen to be makeuped by the audience. Now, this may or may not help. Uh, but here are the contents slightly larger, in A3 form. Uh, you can see uh, the words Leichner, um, London, I think, on the bottom, but I think they were a German company, uh, and the different lengths of rather oily, delicious kind of makeup sticks. Uh, so that's a somewhat blown up version. And in case the, the book cover and the makeup box are a bit small, here is also a larger version. And I actually thought almost needed a t-shirt as well, and we could have wide sort of merchandise of this, but probably a book covers enough. Um, and here it is here with its delicious globules and the lettering, which I'm hoping someone can help me out with later on. Okay, so what did Yeah, oh my god, how exciting. If anyone, if anyone actually wants to grab that and um, take it back and have a look, please do. Chris, if anyone's worked in theatre, my mm. brain is just triggered from years ago yeah. being in theatre that five and nine were the colours. Five, was, does that ring bells for anyone? Five was paler, you put yeah. five on as your base, and they were th exactly those yeah. sticks, and nine yeah. was darker, so you did your shading with nine. So, uh, I don't know if there's five and nine in that box, but they were the two crucial basic colours. Ah, uh, I, I, will, I will be ferreting through these a bit later in Stronger Light, see if I can find five and nine. Uh, lots of different flesh tones, and then whites and creams and blacks and browns and, and all sorts of colours. So, what happened with this box was that it was passed from... Um, from John Hunter down to a chap called David Wildey. Um, David was based in the Pacific during the war. He spent time in, uh, in near Numea in New Caledonia and also in uh, the Solomon Islands. Uh, and David fell in love during the war. Really interesting kind of story, which is partly told in a couple of chapters in the book um, and elsewhere. Uh, David came back, lived in Auckland in Christchurch, and then for a time um, 
he uh, was quite an avid collector of things. Apparently, when his executor, a chap called Roger, cleaned out his house, there were boxes and boxes and boxes and boxes of stuff, including World War II memorabilia, his World War II diaries, photos of gay men in Christchurch in the 1930s and 40s and 50s and 60s um, and 70s, uh, and this box. And I made friends with Roger after doing a presentation about um, an earlier book in Christchurch, and so he said, have this. And so I have always been quite interested in our performance and the Kiwi Concert Party, and so my own kind of object at home is this little box that has this incredible story of um, entertainment and uh, developing gay identity and solidarity and um, gay community and being passed down to me as a kind of a gay heirloom, which I think is really kind of lovely. And so it's something with a really rich kind of history as well as these really quite delicious globules. <laughs> and, and so just before I go back to my seat and actually let someone else have a go, um, the wording on the box. Yeah, I think, I think the name, uh, cherry plum fairy. Cherry plum. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, that is fantastic. Oh, I don't know that John would ever have known that, but he might. It seems too coincidental somehow. Cherry Plum Fairy, love it, love it, love it, love it. Okay, on that note. Right, hang on. Oh, I should just put that back. Maybe it doesn't want to be a Madonna microphone anymore. <laughs> thank you, Chris. Right, thank you, Brian. Thank you for Chris. Now, please welcome Jack, who is, of course, our cryptid from the hills of East Auckland. I just want to note that uh, my presence or not here does not constitute any proof of my actual existence. <laughs> just, we'll start there. Uh, while I may now be in the uh, hills of East Auckland, that wasn't always where I am from. So my object from home um, is this. This is, uh, look, first I will say that as a writer of very short fiction, being asked to prepare something for 10 minutes was terrifying, and I am terrified. <laughs> But uh, this is a Wellington Lions rugby jersey, and they are my home team. And home will always be linked to sports for me, although I can link anything to sports, challenge me. Um, there's an advantage to being at home on your home turf, and uh, despite having accepted grudgingly I am an Aucklander now, they're still my home team. This is actually the first rugby jersey that I ever owned, and I got it when I was 14. I had long been a rugby fan, but my parents were sensible people who, despite how much eight, nine, ten-year-old me begged, refused to spend $80 on a shirt that I was going to grow out of, or spill paint on, or lose. So. I loved the Wellington Lions and the Hurricanes and the All Blacks with the kind of intensity that queer kids seem to specialise in. <laughs> My bedroom walls were covered in posters of rugby players and watermarked pictures printed from the internet on a dodgy in in inkjet printer. But at 14, something changed. I was allowed to go to Westpac Trust Stadium without my father, who had been shepherding me to games for a few years, but with my best friend, Emma. And uh, to celebrate this, Emma and I completely painted our faces black and gold. Neither of us were artistically inclined, so the outcome was not impressive in its sophistication, but very impressive in its scope. And we headed to the match early like really early, 
because my level of devotion was such that I wanted to sit for more than an hour before the game started to watch the players warm up. But that devotion was richly rewarded because the game day marketing crew staged a cheering competition. Given there were barely 100 people in the entire stadium while this competition took place, Emma and I were two of the winners. After yelling as loud as possible, and we were 14, so that was loud, and being chosen, I pretty much hyperventilated. So along with four other people, we watched a Wellington victory. And don't at me on this. I know the exact game because it contains one of my favorite comedy tries of all time. We watched from a corporate box with all the soft drink we could drink. <laughs> And then after the match, we were all taken down into the concrete bowels of Westpac Trust Stadium and were each presented with a jersey by none other than Captain Tano Umanga. He, he even signed it. I hyperventilated again. <laughs> I wore this jersey constantly for about a week. I slept in it. This was payment from the universe for my years of love, and I hadn't even had to convince my parents to buy it for me. The game was at the start of the school holidays, and my dad took me and a couple of my friends to Mount Ruapehu, where we all made an effort to learn to snowboard, and I wore this jersey over my parka. And I maintain I looked cool. <laughs> And yes, if you're thinking, wait, you wore a giant shirt to do an activity that involves getting covered in the snow, and then you slept in that shirt, I can only say that yes, yes I did. Such is the power of love. <laughs> I finally surrendered the jersey to the washing machine after a few days, but it has been with me ever since. Other jerseys have gone into storage, none of which were bought by my parents, I just want to note, but this one has stayed. I took it to the UK. I've toted it through my innumerable house moves because it's something that ties me inextricably to home, my home team, and my home ground. Emma now lives in New York, but we're still close friends. When I told her that I was planning to talk about the time we parlayed our terrible face painting skills in shrill teenage voices into a corporate box and a couple of rugby jerseys, she responded with one of the dumbest in-jokes from that time that we've ever had. So home has a memory and a sense of humor. And Tana Umanga's signature remains on the collar after many, many washes, and this makes it even more precious to me. My father passed away when I was still a teenager, and Tana Umanga was his absolute favorite player. I don't wear this jersey often anymore. I'm now a rugby referee, and referees are known for hoarding kit until the cupboards are bursting and our significant others threaten to leave us unless we get rid of some of it. And there's only so many pyjama tops a boy needs, particularly now I live in Auckland where it's too hot to sleep in something this hefty. <laughs> and because I'm a queer referee, I have rugby jerseys from actual gay tournaments, which might make my designating this particular one a precious queer object a bit sus. But this jersey is an object that harkens back to those terrible teenage years where everything felt so much and all at once. And I loved rugby and rugby players with such intensity. I loved them so much that despite being a 14-year-old who was very concerned about my clothes being right, I still wore this giant monstrosity of a shirt for a week, clinging to it like a toddler does to a security blanket. This jersey represents not just home, but a quintessential experience for many queer teens. Displays of love that can be explained away as something else. In my case, it was a love that to other people just looked like a kid who was kind of obsessive about their home team. And sport is one of my favorite subjects to write about. I have an absolute weakness for the absurd, and now that I am not a lovesick teenager, we're obsessed with the possibility of maybe one day, maybe kissing an all black, I can admit that sports are pretty absurd. This is not to say that they aren't important, because that would invalidate my entire life. They're extremely important. But that doesn't stop them from also being completely ridiculous. For instance, professional rugby players in this century actually wore jerseys like this. 
It has a giant collar on it. It has buttons. It weighs about 10 kilos when it gets wet. Far from being the precision engineered garments that Adidas wants us to associate with professional rugby, they played in something that looks like it came through a time machine from the 70s. It's truly ridiculous and yet sublime, which is basically the experience of being in love and the feeling of going home again. Aww. So, thank you. Thank you so much, Jack. That was wonderful. Now, we might need to move a little bit, Ian, might we? Because you've got some... We'll be okay? Okay. So Ian has, has got something a little unusual for us. <laughs> Yay. I've, um, I've asked Brendan and my partner Mark to help me with this presentation. I want to take you back 50 years to the early years of the gay liberation movement in New Zealand. In 1971, the baby boomer generation was really making its presence felt in this country and around the world. Women were marching and holding meetings agitating for equal rights, for independent financial freedom, equal pay, abortion rights, and gay people, and this was the era before LGBTQI letter sequencing, were also beginning to raise their voices. When you say things like queer bastard, commie bastard, black bastard, you're just, talk, you're just a talking lump of orgasm, repeating what thousands have been taught by thousands before them to say. A thing without original thought that won't add a single worthwhile contribution to this life. You can't define why you say queer bastard. You haven't the faintest notion of what it means to be a homosexual. It's not understood, so it's condemned. It's other people who force homosexuals to lead abnormal lives of fear, deception, hate, isolation, despair. Some churches are the same, but that's just ludicrous, seeing that Christ himself was prob probably a non-practicing homosexual. It's partly ignorance, fear of the unknown, and being afraid that someone else is getting some pleasure that you're missing out on. Well, that was part of a crucial speech in a play written here in Auckland 50 years ago this year. The playwright was a talented Englishman who had immigrated to New Zealand six years earlier. He was an accountant by day and an enthusiastic actor, writer and musician by night. His name was Ian Truffitt. Um, and the play was called A Deal to Judge, which he wrote under the pseudonym Linton Keane. The reason the play was significant is that it won the, ninth, uh, the New Zealand One Act playwriting competition in 1971. The play was selected from about 50 entries. It was published, and the following year it received performances in Auckland and Christchurch, maybe elsewhere, I don't know. And if you think New Zealand was a wasteland for gay writing 50 years ago, you would be wrong. The competition judge, Eve Hughes, in her comments to Ian Truffitt said, that quote, the theme of the play, has been tackled frequently from different aspects during recent years, but I feel yours has an original approach. A deal to judge fitted right into the ethos of the gay liberation movement. Ian Truffitt wasn't an activist in the usual sense of the word. He was a middle-class professional man, 32 years of age, an only child who lived with his super respectable mother who had immigrated here with him. But he shared the anger of the gay liberationists. In addition to wanting liberation for all gay and lesbian people, he wanted his own liberation. The play opens with an unusually long description of the desired setting. The action takes place during one evening in a flat situated in one of the older areas of a large city. Everything about the room is dark, gloomy, and somewhat sinister. The furniture is limited to an armchair, a small table, an upright chair, a record player, and a bookcase. And these tend to mingle into darkened, indefinable corners to give the room an undetermined shape and size. There are a few domestic items in evidence, but these are insignificant compared with the other items which adorn the room. A stuffed bird of prey, a skull, a thick wooden staff, 
a sword, a silver goblet, and a five-pointed star set in a circle. Over all is set in startling ascendancy a grotesque picture of a tower from which lightning is issuing and from which people are falling, a reproduction of the tarot card, The Tower. Lightning purports to come from a coloured bulb in the ceiling, and it is subdued. Two young men enter, and it appears that one has picked, the up, picked up the other and brought him home for sex. But no, one of them, with the unlikely name of Wand, has lured the other one, Douglas, back with the promise of a private viewing of pornography. But Douglas is spooked by the atmosphere. I don't like all this darkness and all this junk. It's weird. You picked up the wrong guy, mate. I know why you brought me here. You're queer. Well, I'm not, and I don't like puffs. I don't have anything to do with homos. You can go stuff your granny. I'm going back to the strip club for some decent sex fun. When Douglas queries Wand's unusual name, Wand explains that it comes from tarot cards. He locks the door and invites Douglas to sit down in an armchair. It is only then that Douglas realises the chair is occupied by a third person. Wand says, Oh, I'm sorry. Did I give you a fright? Andre's so quiet, I sometimes forget he's here. Would you like to meet Andre? He's not really Russian, but being a ballet dancer, he finds it much better, much more effective to have a Russian name. Wand then slowly reveals the real reason he has lured Douglas back to the flat he shares with Andre. It has everything to do with a woman called Christine Turner. She was a lesbian. She was also a girl with a pretty face, two arms, two legs, a brain, a heart. She was a lesbian. She was a girl who had an invalid mother that depended on her. She was a lesbian. She was also a nurse who was devoted to caring for little children with muscular dystrophy, children with short lives ahead of them, children who depend on her love. She was a... Oh, for pity's sake. Don't say she was a lesbian anymore. If I wanted to hear that again, I'd use a tape recorder, something incapable of higher thought. No. Let's say she was. Her life was taken away from her, and now an invalid is without someone to care for her. Now some children have lost the person who gave them hope. She was a good kid. We loved Chris. Wand then asks Andre to fetch a pack of tarot cards and explains that they are for fortune telling, and they're going to play the game now to tell Douglas's fortune. Wand switches on a light which makes the tower flash and asks Douglas to cut the pack. Then Wand theatrically lays out the cards, explaining each one and describing how they relate to Douglas's life and what he has done to Christine Turner. You didn't kill Christine Turner. You got someone else to do it for you. They got the guy that did the deed. Of him that thought they took no heed. We do take heed, Douglas. You've been obsessed with the idea of killing Christine Turner for months, just because she was a lesbian. You've been telling your friends how easy it would be to tamper with the brakes of her car so that when she left the hospital after night duty, she'd turn down the hill and wouldn't be able to stop. Then you found this other guy who didn't like his lesbians either, and you worked on him, feeding his mind with the idea so that eventually, he thought it was his own. Oh yes, you're clever in your own depraved way. As the tension builds, Douglas's bravado crumbles. It's obvious that Wand and Andre know all about him, have deliberately sought him out to exert their own idiosyncratic ven vengeance on the young man behind the murder of their lesbian friend. As each card is revealed, they increase the pressure on him until it becomes unbearable. No, no I, I don't want to listen anymore. It's horrible. Put the light on. I, I can't bear the dark. But they don't give up. Wand holds a lighted candle up to Douglas's face. A long, thin, milk-white phallic symbol with a white-hot flame at the end to burn out the wickedness, the evil, the depravity from your brain. Burn it out! Searing, scorching, stinking flesh of Douglas. Through the bone! Searing, scorching, stinking bone of Douglas. Through the brain! Searing, scorching, stinking brain of Douglas. Searing, scorching, stinking brain of Douglas. Look, the flame is lighting up little parts of his brain. Little black cells with the devil's horns are jumping up and down saying, Kill Christine Turner! Kill Christine Turner! Burn them out! Burn! 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 Wand then uncovers the penultimate card, which is the hanged man. 
how, <clears throat> how easy it would be for Andy and I to play the god of destruction on you, just as you played the god of destruction on Christine Turner. After all, we have as much right to do this as you had, an eye for an eye, a life for a life. And what's your life worth, Douglas? It hasn't been worth anything as yet, and the hanged man tells me it won't be worth anything in the future. It says you just want to escape from reality, to escape your responsibilities, to go on as before. But we can't allow you to go on as before, can we, Douglas? We can't give you the chance to kill another Christine Turner, can we? Don't kill me. You said you wouldn't hurt me. No, they don't kill him. But Wand reveals that the last card, the 13th card, is death. Andre has shrouded himself in a black cloak and holds the rope and the skull. As Douglas pleads for mercy, Wand suddenly ends the mock trial and unlocks the door. You can go now, Douglas. The door's unlocked. You can go now, Douglas. And if you like, you can take a little phallic souvenir with you. It will be the only ray of light in your life, and it will probably burn for about another five minutes. Stand up, Douglas. You know now what you have to do, don't you, Douglas? It's the only thing you can do. Douglas finally murmurs, I'm sorry, and leaves. Wand and Andre move to the window and look out to satisfy themselves that Douglas has done what he should do. The curtain falls. So, melodramatic, yes, and this play probably wouldn't be performed today. <laughs> but here's what, here's what one of our great thespians said of it. Actor and director Raymond Hawthorne was in the audience for the first performance. And afterwards, he wrote, this is an excellent play. It is well constructed and a marvelously theatrical idea. A worthwhile theme, a thought-provoking play, and deeply imaginative. Really terrific to see this play. Let's hope for a great deal more from this writer. <clears throat> well, Ian Truffitt did write other plays, including other gay plays, both one-act and full-length dramas, but sadly, he didn't see any of them staged again. In the same year of his triumph with a deal to judge, he met me. I was a university student at the time. We fell in love and he left his mother to live with me, thus achieving part of his own gay liberation. In 1973, we traveled to England and settled there together. But sadly, three years later, he was killed on his motorbike on an icy country lane. He named me as his literary executor in his will. So on this 50th anniversary, I want to remember this play, just a small stone on the great wall of gay history that he and many others have built. So I've got it here. This is my memorable, memorable queer object. Thank you, Ian, and thank you to your wonderful partner. And, and the other reader, thank you for joining in and helping Ian to do that. And now, let's welcome Ramon. Oh, Rodrigo, you made it. There you go. Grab a seat. Kia ora koutou. Um, I would just like to say thank you to Sam and Carol and same, same, but different for having me here. Um, it's an honour to share the stage with writers, creatives to my right. Um, so, yeah, thank you. I was 12 years old when I broke into an orchestra of tears and begged my father to make it all stop. I remember sobbing way too hard, the kind of hard sob where your entire body and the lines that occupy the interior are all invested in this emotional, uncontrollable convulsion. I have experience in the art of crying. It happened to me a lot in my childhood. 
Most of it was justified. Being bullied or tormented or beaten up for being different was a natural occurrence in my young life. I was a sensitive soul and I owned enormous dramatic flair. So it often ended in waterworks accompanied by these giant sharp gasps and heavy breaths that would fling out of my mouth with purpose and intent. Those noises still exist in my world today. I ah and ah at everything and nothing, and most of the time I have no idea that I'm making these noises, I digress. <laughs> Sometimes I was an outright nightmare of a kid. I know, you're shocked, right? I'm not going to mince words. I could be an utter shit. I'm an Aries dragon, so I had far too much fire for my own be-twitching good. Sometimes I would stand there and zap the fire out of my fingers and watch it land on everything, and that threatened my safety. It was a protection thing most of the time. Sometimes I couldn't tell the difference. Sometimes I was just there for the zap. Things were complicated growing up. What I knew was that I wasn't like most kids. I just didn't have the language or the comprehension to process that notion. I didn't know what trans was. I just knew that I was a girl and that one day the rest of the world would eventually catch up to me. That was the hope. Anyway, so yeah, I cried a lot. And P.S., the world did eventually catch up. My dad was a strong, proud Maori man who, much like myself, couldn't quite articulate the nuances, the ticks and curves of my life at the time. Like most fathers, he tried his best, and like most fathers, he sometimes missed the mark. I grew up in a very sport-focused household, my father was a rugby player. <laughs> he was a prop. Wait, a hooker. Wait, a f he played in the forwards. Okay. Um, he played rugby. My brother, Sai, who was two and a half years older than me, also played rugby. My mother was a consummate cheerleader, which meant she screamed a lot from the sidelines, embarrassingly so that I would often find myself tree climbing or down by the creek hoping not to fall in, but secretly hoping I did. <laughs> Just anywhere far, far, far away from the field was where I would be. Also, on the weekends, our house would be rumbling with the chaos of grown men and women shrieking at the rugby on television. I mean, I'm sure a lot of you can relate. I always thought there was a curious tradition to witness. Something I would just, sometimes I would just watch them in slow motion and put voices to their faces, like a David Attenborough narrated piece about the untamed wildlife in suburbia and watch the spit fly out of their mouths. <laughs> pointed faces with bulging eyes that moved through space and time like a flinch. I always thought there was way too much passion and energy for one room to handle. But as I got older, I realized that very energy became a symbol of home. And in many ways, a memory, a great memory of comfort. I have a version too. <laughs> I know, cute, huh? I was nine or ten when I was told to play rugby. This was the jersey I used to perform in, I mean play in. <laughs> Obviously, I can't fit it anymore. Trust me, I've tried. <laughs> it's summer, crop tops are in. I don't recall much during the two and a half years I played rugby. I'm assuming I've blocked it out of my memory bank and dropped it off at the recycling centre many years ago. But funnily enough, what I do remember I do so with an enormous amount of pride and joy. At the time, it was Nightmare on Elm Street Part 2, 3, and 4. I don't know why I thought rugby wouldn't be in my future. It was inevitable. Huh? I think partly it was about family tradition, which I love and respect. And partly it was about my dad hoping that it might knock the girl out of me. Jesus, if anything, it made her pop out even more. When I would turn up to practice, I'd be like, hi, boys, your halftime show's here. I should have reined it in a little, a lot, but I was cute. And I had to play the damn sport. I thought I might as well have a little fun doing it. I was a left winger. I, 
Yeah, okay, I played on the left. I was tall, lanky, fast, well-trained fast. You had to be fast when you're running away from bullies, am I right? But my parents were so proud. I could see in their faces how proud they were. I was happy that I was making them happy. I did this mostly willingly for them. I think it might have been my first game. I got the ball and I was running towards the try line. I had speed on my side. I knew what I needed to do. I could see the line in front of me and I could see the try play out of my head like a perfect nightmare. I was pushing players off with my long, skinny arms like this. Okay, it probably wasn't like that. I was like, ah, get off me. Ah, don't touch. Ah. <laughs> I could see my parents on the sideline cheering, screaming while being narrated by David Attenborough. And as I jumped over the line and scored a try, I was filled with a weird jolt of satisfaction. I thought, well, this isn't that bad. Even though I hated that I had to do it, I wasn't shit at it. <laughs> I turned around waiting for my moment of glory, you know that moment, of being carried off the field by my fellow rugby mates and everyone was looking at me like I just killed someone. Heads shaking with disappointment, gasps of laughter tinged with utter embarrassment, arms flying around with frantic abandon. I was confused. Then my coach came over and said to me, nice try, but you scored on our try line, not theirs. <laughs> After the game, mum said that she was screaming out to me, you're running the wrong way, turn around. Oh, dear God, turn around. I was like, oh, that's what you were trying to say. <laughs> Sure, I was mortified, but I had learned in my 10, 11 years on living on this planet that when you fall, you pick yourself up and you carry on. So I did. As it turned out, I won trophies. Okay, my first year I won the coach's trophy. I have no idea what that means. You probably will. Um, but it made my father super proud, so it was, that was a good thing. My second torturous year, I won most honest player. Again, not sure. <laughs> was it because I didn't eat someone else's portion of the oranges? Or, or I tackled with manners? I don't, I don't know, but I'll take it. Year three was hard, yeah? I just wanted it all to stop. I was miserable. I was being bullied and beaten up far more frequently, and I was having a hard time keeping my head from exploding. I needed my parents to know that I tried, that I made an effort. I wanted to make them proud of me, but I wasn't happy. I was 12 years old when I broke into an orchestra of tears and begged my father to make it all stop. I didn't have much hope that it would. I was a kid, he was in charge, there are rules. I was hurting and in that moment I was hysterical. I needed my dad to be on my side. I said, Dad, I don't want to play rugby anymore. He turned to me and said, okay, now stop crying. <laughs> and that was it. I never played again. I can't tell you how magnificent this moment was for me. My life was tumultuous, and everywhere I looked, I was being scrutinized for being different, for being trans, for being me. It's hard to believe, but I was 12, and I was used to people staring at me, judging me, preparing to hurt me. But this magnificent moment was the first time in my life that I actually felt seen as a human being. It made me feel that my feelings mattered. It made me love my father more. And it made me realize that whatever happens from here on out in my life, however confrontational or painful, however traumatic or disappointing, that I was going to be OK. For this moment changed something in me forever. When I think of home and a memory that had set my transness on course, a memory that offered me to take some courage and run with it, a memory that told me I was valid, weirdly enough, I think of this time. The moral of the story is, listen to your loved one's cries. That's not always dramatic disguises. Sometimes they are our way of saying, I need you to look at me, see me. Thank you for seeing me tonight.
Thank you. Thank you, Ramon. We've had a wonderful range of, of different speakers tonight, all of them quite wonderful in their own way. Um, there is time, I think, Julie, for some questions. Yes, there is. There, if, has anybody got questions, first of all? There's a microphone that will come around if you have something to ask. Okay, so my second thing is you can either ask a question or are there people out there who have thought of an object from home that is very special to them that they would like to share briefly with us tonight? I have one. It's the thing I always think I would take off the wall if the house was on fire. It's a um, picture that my oldest child did when she was about five, six at school. And it's a picture of her flying a kite and her little sister. And she is bigger than the trees, and her sister only comes to the top of her legs. And it's kind of really symbolic of their relationship. <laughs> Thank you, Julie. Anyone else with either an object that you've thought about or a question to ask any of the participants? My question is to uh, Chris about the, the Queer Objects book. I'm wondering what, what other objects are in the book? Um, yeah, okay, so as, as Carol mentioned initially, uh, this is it's quite an international collection, although New Zealand and Australian objects account for uh, about 50% of it, I think. Um, there are sort of two kinds of objects in there. There are things that are sort of obviously kind of would be, would be seen or created in a queer context. So for instance, placards and um, these sort of funny pinafore things that were worn in protests in Australia, um, those kind of uh, things that are created as part of a queer kind of uh, context. And then there are a whole lot of other things that kind of uh, may be queer or may not be queer. So for instance, uh, we have a, um, a portable record player that was used um, at lesbian parties in the UK during the 1960s. Um, there's one of my favorite little objects, which is uh, from the early 2000s, I think. It's a green party badge, and it says, I only date boys who vote green. Does anyone remember that badge? And I just, I've always looked at that badge thinking, man, this is kind of queer in a particular kind of setting, and depending on who has the badge. I've actually got both at home. I've got only date girls who vote green and only uh, vote boys who... Uh, Day boys who vote green. So that's kind of a neat little example. But one of my favourite examples is actually the telephone, just the old fashioned kind, that rotary dial kind with the kind of round thing that you kind of um, move around. There's a most wonderful, wonderful um, essay in here by my friend Matt Cook, who's actually uh, who lives and teaches in London. And Matt talks about the way in which that telephone, as part of um, a lesbian and gay culture in the UK in the 1970s, afforded a whole lot of connections. So it was the way that he connected with Gay Switchboard when he rang up as this like uber-nervous early teenage kid in, um, in London in the 1980s. The telephone tree, which some of you in the audience I'm guessing were probably also involved in as part of um, social and activist kind of networks, activating the phone tree, and the way he sort of turns around and up and, uh, and, up and down this really pragmatic everyday object and thinks about the way in which it has a really kind of queer life. And the reason whenever it, people ask me this question, I always end up talking about the telephone, is because it makes me think that pretty much any object, anything we can think of, can be a queer object in a particular kind of set of circumstances. And when I talked about the book in Wellington, um, I said, can anyone think of anything that definitely wouldn't be a queer object? So my little challenge to you is, can you think of anything that is not possibly queer? And if you can, you can have all the packets of chips in that thing <laughs> sitting on the end. Because it's not as easy as it sounds. Can 
even if you were to say something like Brian Tamaki's leather jacket, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty. It, uh, they're making America great again. Cap. I think you might have just done yourself a pile of bows. <laughs> Does anyone disagree? Have you got a quick? Things like Milo Yiannopoulos, who is definitely queer, and yeah. also definitely wore a mega cap, might. <laughs> You're totally right. I was get out. Yeah, no. I, I was in the offer of the snacks at the end of the stage, sorry. So even that, even that cat. Um, but, I mean, there's also a chapter on the smartphone in there. And if you think about the way that's insinuated into queer life, as it's insinuated into every other form of kind of life, even that is kind of, um, even that is kind of queer, I think. Also, random self-promotion. Um, there are some flyers for the book just sitting on stage there. They're very queer objects, there are about 20 of them. Um, yeah, if you'd like to kind of take a copy. So, yeah, I could talk more about what's in the book, but I mean, I think um, it really geographically, just while I'm plugging this and while no one's sticking their hand up to stop me talking, uh, really, New Zealand, Australia, the UK, um, the US, uh, Thailand, Japan, Poland, France, Spain, Italy, Germany. Mm, that might be the Czech Republic. That might be sort of the, yeah. So we tried to go kind of broad. Um, lots of my own friends. And it, it sort of justified me spending University of Otago money on a bit of a trip around Europe. <laughs> seeing my friends, and also going to the Sex Machines Museum in Prague. If anyone ever wants COVID, hopefully, you know, vanquished, go there. It's great. And then if you're like me, you'll wander around taking photos of everything and everyone will think you're a bit strange. But that's a good thing about being an academic who just says, research, stop looking at me with that tone of voice, and then you can do what you want. It's great. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Has anyone else thought? Yes. Joe down here has got a. Joe, can you shout or do you need a no, microphone? No, need mic. I'm not exactly so much thinking of. Um, uh, I'll sit down. Uh, oh, here. Um, I'm not so much thinking of um, an object that I've got, but, but of how we um, invest or understand value in objects. Because there's, there's a kind of sentiment, isn't there? I mean, there's a, they become symbols or totems. But also there's a, there's a monetary value, and objects are really interesting because they, the va the, the, they defy the definition of value, the way that we, we, we kind of sit in a capitalist system you know, and, and understand value in terms of the weight of gold or the weight of silver. But, but, but it's, it's about invested value. And um, did you, is that, do you deal with any of those issues? Because that's a real art historian's approach. Yeah, I mean, in, in many ways, I wasn't thinking, and I don't think the contributors were thinking of monetary value at all. So the kinds of values they were thinking about are exactly the kinds that you were talking about, Joe. that they're not, that they're emotional connections yes. mostly, yes. and uh, personal connections and ways that people can articulate something about their own history and their own biography. So I agree, it's very much that kind of value yes. that, that, that the contributors uh, focus on very much. I mean, the most expensive thing is a, um, it's called the Warren Cup, and it's a piece of Roman silverware in the British Museum, but actually its value is not, to us, is not so much about that, and it's more about its kind of depiction of intimate relationships between male figures. So mm. again, it's worth some staggering amount of money, but I don't have a clue how much. <laughs> that almost becomes a bit sort of irrelevant in yes, a way. Yes, yes, it's yeah. interesting, isn't it? I mean, that whole notion of objects um, is something that we we think of in terms of value, but but it's but it sits in different categories of value, yeah, doesn't it? Absolutely. And I think it's, it's that sort of relationship and the contrast, which is so really uh, makes make, makes that kind of uh, just comparison so rich. 
Yeah. Yeah, Without absolutely. Being. So a very cheap photographic print, for instance, yeah. which, which may only be, you know, a few cents in the production and yet can have a huge amount of um, resonance to, mm. to someone, mm. uh, whether it's their own possession or whether it's something passed down the generations, like a postcard in the book, which is said to have belonged to Oscar Wilde and then been passed down the generations, for instance. But again, it's a, an effective value or a kind of... a. Um, a, a community building kind of meaning in a sense. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, interesting. And in fact, the, the emotional value of the object is exactly what everybody's talked about tonight. That's really the whole point of it, isn't it? Yes. Has anyone else got any comment they want to make? Because if not, we will hand over to Ian to do the awards. We've got, yes, another comment here. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, I just have a question for Ramon, since I know you're a performer and you've been involved in music for a long time, since you were little. Mm -hmm. And it's if you had to pick a musical instrument or a musical object, it could be like a record or a CD that really influenced you as a queer artist and that really influenced that part and inspired you, what would you choose? <laughs> what a beautiful question. Did you pay for that? Uh, no, actually, no, I love this thing. Uh, tambourine, I think of an instrument, I think I'd like tambourine. Um, but I love record records. I have lots of record covers on my wall. So, um, yeah, thank you for that question. Ian, you can hold on to it, because you might be doing the, the awards in a moment. Anybody else got anything to say? Well, I'd like to thank the panellists for a most fascinating and unusual... <laughs>